Romans chapter 8. What I want to talk about this morning is uh, walking after the Spirit, what that means. Paul, Paul, Paul talks about it twice here in, in Romans 8. He mentions it in verse 1, verse 4. And it's, he, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. You know what that means? That's not a positional statement. Amen. Right? It's a, it's, a, it's a conditional statement about those in Christ who don't walk after the flesh but after the Spirit, meaning, meaning a believer in Christ can walk after one of two things, right? And what I want to talk about this morning is walking after the Spirit and what it means. I mean, that's a statement right there and a half, right? Who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Now, the, the average Christian in America today, they don't, I mean, I've, I've been at this thing for a while. I'm just now beginning to fully comprehend what it means to walk after the Spirit. Do you know what it means to serve in newness of spirit? Right? Now, now we're not getting on to anybody. I'm just letting you know that this is an important, important verse. And understanding what it means to walk after the spirit, how you do it. Because, because what I, look, look here in Romans 8.1. The first thing I want you to notice is that Romans 8.1 is a conclusion. See the first three words, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Now that's a conclusion. And what Paul is doing here is he's concluding the section of Romans that deals, all right, you go back here to Romans 3.21 through I always say 511. Some people say 21. I've got my reasons for saying 511. But he concludes that section there deals with the doctrine of justification. And then from 512 going up to 839, you're dealing with the doctrine of sanctification. So you know what Romans 8 is? It's a conclusion of this section of the Bible dealing with your sanctification in Christ, right? And just like Paul, if you come back to Romans 5, just like Paul back in Romans 5 when he concluded the section on justification, he gave you the results of being justified, didn't he? Romans 5.1, therefore being justified by what? faith we have we have so what do we have we have peace with God we have we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand we rejoice in hope of glory we glory in tribulation knowing some things right we joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement but here's what I want you to understand Everything in Romans 5 and everything you have in Romans 5 is predicated upon the fact of you being justified by faith. If you're not justified by faith, you don't have any of those things. So the, the foundation of Romans 5 is being justified by faith. Well then, what is Romans 8 predicated upon? Romans 8 is the results and benefits of those who walk after the Spirit. It's predicated on being in Christ and walking after the Spirit. You can be in Christ and walk after the flesh. And so, and so what, what we're going to look at this morning is what that means to walk after the Spirit. Now, many are going to disagree with what I'm about to say. But if you look there at verse 1, tell me how else you were to read that. 
You, people want it to be positional. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, period. The average, the average grace believer today reads that verse just like the NIV and all the corrupt translations of the Word of God want you to read that verse. Everything in the chapter is predicated upon those who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. This is not positional doctrine. This is about functional and, 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 and walking after who God has made you to be in Christ. And all the results here, verse 1, who walk not after the flesh. Look at the end of verse 4. That, that, that result there of the righteousness of the law being fulfilled in you. Who what? Walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Look at, look at verse uh, 5. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. What, that's positional as well? Right? Look at, look at verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Talking about two different kinds of minds. Look at verse 13. Ver, well, look at verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye, who? The brethren. Those who have Christ in them. What happens to them if they live after the flesh? They die. Say, so, uh-oh. Right? You know, listen. It, man, is so, man is so simple that we try to read the Bible in light of our understanding of things. Who do you believe is the authority of death? You or God? God. When you think of death, you think of not breathing anymore. God fully, when God talks about death, if you're going to understand death from God's perspective, you're going to have to read your Bible and get out of your way. Get out of your own way. What does he mean there, you shall die, you shall die, you shall die? Well, what did Paul mean back in verse 9 when he says, I was alive without the law and the commandment came, sin revived and I died? You know how many deaths there are in the Bible? See, God doesn't give you the narrow view that science gives you. God gives you the full meaning of death. Physical, spiritual, positional, eternal, functional. Right? You can be alive and not function in life. Not walk in life. Remember what Paul said? He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. If you're going to understand a verse like that, you're going to have to quit thinking that life and death is breathing or not breathing. Yes, sir. Amen. It's functional. Paul said, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify, there's that word death again, bring to death the deeds of the body, ye shall what? Live. This is not, this is not blanketed statements, guys, about every man in Christ. These are conditional. They're predicated on some things. Walking after the Spirit, having a spiritual mind, minding the things of the Spirit, mortifying the deeds of the body. Look at verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Right? So all I want you to understand here right now is that Romans 8 are not verses and, and, and things that deal with uh, 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 with positional truth. Romans 8, no condemnation, freedom from the law of sin and death, the righteousness of the law being fulfilled in you, life and peace, having your mortal body quickened, living unto God, being a son of God, led of the spirit of God, 
These are not automatic as a result of justification. These things are not even automatic through positional sanctification. These things only become reality and functional in a person who walks in accordance to his sanctified position. You've been made somebody in Christ. Okay? Paul's going to lay it out for you in Romans 6, 1 through 7, 6. You've been made something by baptism into Christ. And if you walk after that truth, and after those truths, if you walk after the Spirit, then and, and you walk in accordance to that sanctified position in Christ, then you are going to begin to function the way Romans 8 says you're going to function. You're not going to be that old wretched man who shall deliver me from the body of this death. Those who walk in accordance to the position they have in Christ, they find freedom from the law of sin and death. They no longer have a mind that functions in death. They have a mind of life and peace. Right? And, and, and this, we're just getting a foundation right now. Of what, of what Paul means about walking after the Spirit. Romans 8, you cannot read Romans 8 like so many people do and think it's just blanketed statements about all justified believers. Because I'm telling you right now, there are a lot of justified people that don't groan within themselves waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. I'm telling you right now, there's a lot of Christians that aren't crying, Abba, Father. There are a lot of justified people who, have, who cannot honestly say that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. There are a lot of justified people who cannot say that they have life and peace. Those are not positional verses. That's why when you remove the who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit from verse 1, you destroy the entire passage. And that's why Satan attacks that verse so hard. Because who doesn't want you functioning in the life and power of Jesus Christ? He wants you thinking that all that stuff's positional and the, the truer, higher reality is who you are in the flesh. I'm telling you right now, who you are in Christ is more real than what you look at in a mirror. Who God's made you in Christ by baptism of the Spirit into the body of His Son, those are of higher realities than who you are in your flesh. And to walk around thinking that the flesh has a higher reality than who you are in Christ thinking that bondage to sin is my reality, freedom from sin is some mythological position, denies the truths of the Spirit of God, and you can't walk after the Spirit denying those truths. All right, so look at Romans 8, 2. Anybody who thinks these things are just positional Truths in Romans 8, they got some explaining to do in light of chapter 7. Look, look at Romans 8, 2. Just read Romans 8, 2 and compare it back to 7, 23. Tell me there ain't a difference there. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Well, reconcile that with 7, 23. Where Paul says, I see another law of my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. Reconcile those two passages for me, Cleve. One verse, one verse, he's in captivity to the law of sin. In another verse, he's been made free from the law of sin and death. What's the difference? How he's walking. Romans 7, he's walking after the flesh. Romans 8, he's walking after the spirit. Right? Look at, look at, look at Romans 8, 6. To be carnally minded is death. 
to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What mind did Paul have in Romans 7? Carnal. What was he? Look, look, look at his state in verse number 8. At the end of the verse he says, For without the law sin was dead, for I was alive without the law. Once. You see that? But when the commandment came, what revived? What happened to Paul? There you go. So if he's in a state of death, if he died, what is he? He's in death. So by, by Romans 8, 6 definition, if Paul's dead, what kind of mind does he have? What kind of mind do you have? Well, if you ain't functioning in life, what does it say about your mind? To be carnally minded as death, be spiritually minded as life and peace. Right? Look at look at look at Romans uh, eight thirteen, where he says, "But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall what?" Now compare that back to Romans 7, 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now you see the problems there? You see Romans chapter 7 and chapter 8 are showing you the, the, the functionality of those, what's going to happen if you walk after the flesh, what's going to happen if you walk after the spirit. Romans 8 is not positional doctrine, and it's proved by Romans 7. Paul's having a, there's a different experience in Romans 8 than the one he had in Romans 7. Romans 7, he's in captivity to sin. Romans 8, he's free from sin. Romans 7, he's in a body of death. Romans 8, 13, he says, if you mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. He didn't say if you're in Christ. He said, if you through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. You know what the law, now watch this now. I'm going to show you how different these two are. What did the law do to sin? It revived it. What does the Spirit do? Puts it to death. And you, if you don't get those differences, you're going to end up walking in a system that just constantly brings sin to motion in your life and kills you. There's, there's a, and, and, and so this is no small stuff, man, we're talking about. But here's what I want you to get now. Romans 8, 1 is a conclusion, and it's, it's founded on the principles of walking after the Spirit. So if Paul is making a conclusion, now get, get understand that. If Paul is making a conclusion, and that conclusion is founded on the principles of walking. It's founded on walking after the Spirit. Then what does that mean? Doesn't that mean Paul has already taught you how to walk after the Spirit? It's not for you to figure it out. You get to Romans 8.1. Well, what does he mean walking after the Spirit? Well, if he's making a conclusion based upon the facts of walking after the Spirit, then that means he's already previously taught you how to walk after the Spirit. Does it not? Okay. So what we're going to do now real quick is we're going to go back and do... What we're going to do real quick is we're going to go back and look at, 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 at an overview of some things in the previous chapters that's going to teach you what it means to walk after the Spirit. All right, come back to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5. What we're going to talk about here 
is your legal identity. Legal identity. I'd love to go through all this, but just look at Romans 5.18. This legal identity deals with your justification. That is the foundation. That, that doctrine right there is the foundation of how you're going to walk now. Paul's going to go into a positional identity, which deals with your sanctification. But this, this, this foundation, what I'm about to show you, man, what I'm about to show you right here is going to make a big deal in your life, right? Look at what he says, Romans 5, 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to what? Condemnation. I, I mean, honest to goodness, if people would just read their Bible, the issue of your judgment is already settled. Man ain't waiting to see what's going to happen to him. Well, I hope I've lived a good enough life. I hope I make it. I hope I get it. The judgment came by the offense of one upon who? All men to what? Condemnation. No waiting to find out what's going to happen. A man without Christ and outside of Christ is sitting in a death chamber waiting the day of execution. But look at what he says, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon who? All men unto what? Justification of life. You know what that means? It means there's a new legal status. There's a new legal standing in the throne of God, at the throne of God. Not by what you've done. The judgment upon all men was overturned by the righteousness of one man. You've just read that. The condemnation that God judged upon all men has now been overturned from condemnation of death to justification of life. God's throne has overturned his judgment against men. How did he do it? By the righteousness of one man. Good luck overturning it back. Right? Now, do you know why I have a new legal standing before God? Verse 19 tells you. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. You say, I have a new legal standing in the sight of God because I have a new legal identity. When I was under condemnation, it was because I was a sinner. By the disobedience of one, many were made sinners. And because I was a sinner, through Adam's disobedience, God's judgment was under condemnation of all men. Man say, well, that don't seem fair. Eh, the law came and proved that you were all sinners anyway. But the reality is, is I had an identity in Adam. My identity in Adam was a sinner. And because I was a sinner, I was under the condemnation of God. Now the reason that God has overturned my condemnation to justification of life is because by one man's obedience, I was made righteous. Now get that. How was I made righteous? By one man's obedience. Listen, I'm no longer a sinner. Amen? Until you start understanding that reality, 
A lot of this stuff moving forward about walking after the Spirit is never going to come in. Nobody's talking about what you're doing or what you did. You be, you're going to have to start on the foundational principle of understanding your legal identity in the sight of God. If you're ever going to experience that no more condemnation, and beginning to understand the concept of life and peace and being under grace. Most people don't even know how to be under grace <coughs> because they don't understand how God's grace was established and how it now reigns. And it's explained to you, the principles are explained to you in Romans 5. How God's grace now reigns. Guess what reigns? Grace, guess what no longer reigns? Sin. Sin shall have no dominion over you because you're not under the law, you're under grace. And until you start understanding these principles, you're not even going to understand what it means to be under grace. I have a new legal identity in the sight of God. God didn't declare me innocent. An innocent man can still be messed. An innocent man can mess up. I may be innocent today and guilty tomorrow. God didn't declare me innocent. I've been declared righteous. Look back in Romans 4 if you want to understand what it is to be declared righteous. Look at Romans 4 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You know, you know what it means for God to have declared you righteous? It means that God is not going to impute your sin to you. Now how you're going to live under grace is going to be dealt with in chapter 6. We ain't worried about man's perversion of grace. We're talking right now about the pure established grace of God through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You ain't even entered the picture yet. Now what man does with grace is completely up to man. But don't you dare think that God's grace is somehow perverted because it's reigning now through the pure, established righteousness of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's nothing perverted about it. Now what you do with it afterwards is on you. And this is what Paul's going to deal with in Romans chapter 6. We're dealing with your legal identity right now. Do you know why I've been declared righteous? Because God is not imputing my sin to me. You know why? Because one man's disobedience brought many offenses. And all of those offenses were justified by one man. Look, look at Romans 5. Look at, look at Romans 5. Uh, look at verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many what? Offenses unto justification. You see, God has made me righteous, Bill, because all of my offenses, all the offenses that came into this world because of Adam's disobedience, Christ in his obedience justified all offenses of man. God hasn't declared me innocent. He's declared me righteous because he's not imputing my sin to me. Now, this is legal identity that cannot be lost. I have a legal identity now before God as righteous. There ain't a thing you can add to that or take away from it. 
I have a legal identity of being righteous before God, and because of that legal identity, the condemnation that God had judged upon me has been overturned, and I now have a new legal standing of justification of life. Amen? You see that many being made righteous, how did it come? It come by one man's obedience. What, is he, is it over tomorrow? Your righteous standing before God is not through your obedience, it's through one man's obedience. Just understand that legal identity. We're not even talking, we're not even talking about what you're doing yet. We're talking about how God is going to see you in before his judgment. God and his throne has determined they're not going to bring any charges against you. If a court decides they're not going to bring any charges against you, it doesn't matter what you've done. That's your identity in that court. Now, now the, the question is, how could God do that? Well, he did it by one man's obedience. Don't worry about it. His righteousness is fully established. And so you have your legal standing by a new legal identity. And now look at Romans 5.21. There's a new legal dominion. That as sin hath reigned, unto death, even so might what? You know what's replaced the reign of sin? Grace. Because here's, here's the old program. The law. The law entered. That law was ordained to what? Life. The law was ordained to life, but what reigned through the law? Right? Through the law, sin reigned unto what? Death. So, so sin reigned through the law of God. In other words, there was a conflict between sin and the law, and because of that conflict, death reigned. Through sin, or through the law, sin reigned unto death. Now let's put grace here because it now reigned. How does grace reign? Through what? Do you understand the difference? That one there was unestablished righteousness. And it couldn't do anything for man because of sin. It says if you will do this, then you'll live. But because of sin, death reigned. Through that law. So what did God do? He established righteousness. There's nothing left for you to establish. The right, the grace of God now reigns through righteousness unto what? Live today, die tomorrow. Do you know what eternal life means? It's over. That is over. How does this work? Because of the righteousness that's been established by God and his son, not by you. You ain't establishing anything. Grace now reigns as the blesser. Right, right here, sin hindered life. It only brought death, but now God, through establishing righteousness, His grace now reigns unto eternal life. It's over with. Rest, man. Take it easy in the righteousness of God. Just believe it. Trust it. Rest in it. <coughs> Amen. God didn't restore you back to Adam's position. You're not, in, you're not in Israel's position. You're not in the Hebrews' position. 
You're not in the revelation position. You're fully established under the dominion of God's grace. Through his fully established righteousness by the obedience of one man. And that grace is now reigning through his righteousness unto your eternal life. You can't die and you can't lose it because it's given to you through the grace of God and his righteousness. Amen. Amen. That's legal. This legal standing and identity and the dominion of God's grace is justification and it's the result of one man's obedience. Get that. You, 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 you say, what? you know why you should get that? Because there ought not be a day goes by in your life you don't thank the blessed Lord Jesus Christ for what he's done. Amen. That one man's obedience saved you from sin and death and the condemnation of God. And by his suffering on that cross completely and eternally changed your destiny, and your identity before God. God put you under his grace so that he could freely give you these things and man is still spitting in the face of the grace of God thinking they're going to help God out. There's nothing that makes me matter than to talk to somebody. Yeah, but if. You think Honest to goodness, what a disgusting, vile person that thinks they can add something yeah, yeah, yeah. to the fully established righteousness of God that brought about the legal dominion of his grace unto eternal life for all men. Blameless. No, that, that blameless has to do with Paul was blameless under the righteousness of the law. It's uh, But he had suffered the loss of that. And I, I believe that blameless means uh, before man and, and by the letter that, that there was no blame to be brought against him. But he wasn't righteous. Well, he had a righteousness in the law, but it wasn't the righteousness of Christ, is the point. Um, look, in, look in Romans 6, the second, the second part here, Romans 6, 1 through 7, 6 deals with positional identity. Notice that Paul writes there, look in Romans 6, 3. As many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ. Right? Now this one, this positional identity deals with your sanctification. Now notice Paul does not mention baptism one single time in connection with this. You don't have to be baptized into Christ to be justified. Any more than Abraham or David did. Did God justify Abraham by faith? Did he justify David by faith? Neither one of them were baptized into Jesus Christ. Baptism into Christ has nothing to do with your justification. Your justification was taken care of by one man's obedience thousands of years before you drew your first breath. Justification deals with legal identity before God. Of being righteous. Positional identity deals with sanctification. Your baptism into Christ deals with sanctification. Now like like I said this morning about baptism. Most most people in the the world. I mean how, 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 how comical it is. That people call their churches Baptist churches. And really can't even. Talk about the doctrine of baptism. If you said, give me a, a definition of baptism. How many Baptists could even do it? Well, it's getting dunked in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You got one of fire. 
You want to try again? Right? I baptize you with water. He that cometh after me is mightier than I, who shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So guess what? Baptism ain't immersion in water. <coughs> There's a baptism of water. John said, I baptize you with water. Right? There's one of the Holy Ghost. There's one of fire. There's a baptism of the Spirit into one body. You know, I love what Doc said one time. What do you think about a book that said there's one baptism? In Ephesians 4, there's one baptism. And then I can go to Matthew and show you three in one verse. And then run you to Hebrews 6 where it says leaving the doctrines of baptisms, plural. And then the Bible says there's one. What are you going to do with a book like that? You better take it serious. Or that book will break your neck. I mean it. Most people don't even know what baptism is in the Bible. Baptism in the Bible is sanctificational. It always has been. It always will be. Anytime a baptism is taking place, something is being sanctified. Sanctification means it's being separated from something to, to something. Your baptism in the Christ is separation from unto. And we're going to see what that is. But this sanctification by baptism is through identification. There's a baptism. Listen, there were baptisms for the priests. Did you know that? There were baptisms in the Old Testament that only the Levitical priests could partake in. They were being separated unto an office. Judeans, uh, uh, the tribe of Dan, none of them could participate in those baptisms in separation unto God. But Israel had a baptism unto who? Moses in the Red Sea. When John baptized, it was baptism unto repentance. Right? Most people, most people think John the Baptist was baptizing to get people saved. <laughs> Believers' baptism. They believed they were looking forward to the cross, brother. They got dunked in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, you know. John was water baptizing unto. He was baptizing unto something. It was under repentance. And he told you that that baptism unto repentance was going to give way to a baptism of a higher authority. Do you know when Israel got the baptism with the Holy Ghost, they are being baptized and identified as the children of promise? Not just children of the flesh. They're being identified there by God as the Israel of God. What does that mean to be the Israel of God? It means you've been set apart unto a holy purpose for God. When you were placed into the Lord Jesus Christ... You were set apart unto God and given the identity of God's Son. Amen. Your baptism into Christ was to separate you from something unto something. And when you read Ephesians or Romans chapter 6, you're going to have to understand this. Our baptism into Christ is to separate us from sin unto righteousness. Look at, look at, look at Romans 6.18. Being then made free from what? Sin. Remember Israel's baptism in the Red Sea? You know who they're being freed from? Pharaoh. To serve who? God. Paul says, being made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. And we're going to look at 
why Paul says this, there's something you have to do in order to come to this point. But what I want you to understand right now is that your baptism into Christ was to separate you from sin unto God. That's what you're, listen, God didn't have to do that. He could have left you down here doing your own thing under his grace. His grace now reigns. Paul said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Then he brings you up to this baptism. But you know God, through, through, the, through the legal identity and the, and the legal reign of his grace, he could have just let you play this thing out, man, and took you to heaven when you died. But he gave you something else. He gave you a baptism into his son to separate you from sin. And separate you unto himself. Right? Look at, look at Romans 6, 4. We are buried with him by what? Baptism into what? Death. For what purpose? To walk in newness of life. You see this? See that cross right there? When you believed... The Spirit of God identified you with that cross. Paul, Paul said, when Paul said, I am crucified, that's how Paul lived every day of his life in that identity. You say, that, 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 listen, this is what it's going to take to walk in the Spirit and to walk after the Spirit. If you don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm crucified, guess what you're going to walk after? Your flesh. I am crucified. I am crucified with who? Nevertheless, I what? Not I, but who? The one who rose from the dead. You were baptized into his death so that you could live his life. Separated from sin unto righteousness. Baptized into his death. Buried with him in baptism. So that as he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so we also should walk in newness of life. Look at, look at Romans 6, 5. For if, we, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Well, what's the likeness of his resurrection and the likeness of his death? Look at Romans 6.10. In that he died, he died unto what? In that he liveth, he liveth unto who? So the likeness of his death is what? Dead unto sin. The likeness of his resurrection is what? Alive unto God. So look at Romans 6, 11. Likewise. Now your, your response to this. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. How you respond to that truth is going to determine what you walk after. Amen. It's one thing to quote a verse, guys. It's a completely other thing to believe it. It's completely something else to believe it. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Reckon that thing to be true, and then verse 12 through 13 shows you how to properly respond to this thing. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. People say, people say, well, I don't have any power over that. Then why would Paul write that? Don't sit, tell me you ain't got no power over sin when Paul just gave you all power and authority to not let it reign. Paul put that on your shoulders. He said, you're free. 
Romans 6, 7, he that is dead is freed from sin. Reckon yourselves to be dead. That's what it's going to take. Simply believing what the Spirit is telling you about your identity in the Son of God. Saying you're freed from sin. You're dead unto sin. You're alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Don't let sin therefore reign in your mortal body. That you should obey it in the lust thereof. When people call me. When, when people ask me this question. I hear it all the time. Guys I'm not saying I'm sinless. I'm not saying I don't have flesh. Because I do. But people write, people will write me all the time and say. And. I'm not seeing this transformation in my life that you're talking about because you're not walking according to the right doctrine. What Paul's laying out for you in Romans 6 is a new way of thinking about who you are. And if you don't receive it and believe it, you're never going to walk in it. You're never going to function in it. I believe I need the law to live righteous. Good night. Well, how can I live without some letter of the law to tell me how to live? Good luck. You know where you're going to be the next 20 years of your life? Well, what I want to do, I can't do. And what I hate is what I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The Spirit of God is getting ready to teach you in Romans 7, you're delivered from the law to serve in newness of spirit. And if you're not going to understand that doctrine and believe it, good luck. Good luck. What's the Spirit of God teaching you here about who you are? He's telling you you're freed from sin. He's telling you you're alive unto God. Now how you respond, reckon it, reckon it. You first got to know it and then reckon it to be real and factual and true. And then not let sin reign, but yield, yield your body over to God. As what? As something that's alive from the dead. Don't present it to God as if it's this dead body of sin. That's not what it is anymore. This body, this body is a member of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baptized into his cross, his burial, so that as he was raised from the dead, you can literally have the resurrection power of Christ functioning and operating in this dead body. Because you're alive unto God through him. Present this body as those that are, read the verse, read, I'm not making it up, read verse 13. How are you supposed to yield yourself unto God? As those that are what? Alive from the dead. Do you believe that or don't you? We're not talking, Paul ain't told you a single thing to do yet. He ain't tell you go out and feed your neighbor. He ain't tell you go knocking doors. He didn't tell you anything to do yet. He's teaching you about who you are in Christ so that you can walk in the reality of it. Look at what he, look at what he says in verse, uh, y'all give me a few moments here. Here's, the, here's, the, here's, the, here's your proper response. Look, look at verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. You know what that means? It means everybody who thinks they're still under the dominion of sin has deceived themselves. Sin shall not have dominion over you. If you think sin still has the dominion, we've got songs in our song book that say that. I've heard preachers say it. If you think sin still has dominion, you don't believe this. And people walking around saying, oh, we're just, you know, we're just 
sinners, and that's all we're ever going to be is sinners. You're not under the dominion of sin anymore. you got to start believing that. Because that's what God's Spirit said. Nobody asks you how you felt or what your flesh is. We're talking about spiritual truths here that are of a higher reality than how you feel. What God has said eternally in his word trumps how you feel right now. Amen? Look at, look at what he says. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. You know what that means? If you put yourself back under the law, guess what you're living in? You're living under a phony dominion. You are not under that. And that, if you don't get that, that is going to revive that. You have got to understand what it means to live under grace. You have to. Now look at what he says in verse 16. Know ye not. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Who? People under grace. You are serving whoever you're obeying. Now Paul had just told you not to let sin reign that you should obey it. Right? Now, Paul says, do you not know that whom you yield yourself servants to obey? If you yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, then you are to obey him. And you are serving whoever you obey. Listen, under this program, you are in bondage. Under grace, you get to choose who you serve. Okay? Anybody who serves sin under grace has chosen to do so because they're free. They're free. I'm so tired of the grace people acting like there's no other option. Blow it out your nose, man. There is an option. You get to choose who you serve and obey today. And Paul says if you, cho if you under grace Choose to serve sin. Guess what it's unto? Death. Well, now, now, now the selfish people come around and like, well, maybe I might want to rethink this. Does Paul mean I'm going to go to hell? You tell me if Paul thinks you're going to hell after what he just wrote in Romans 5. The, your judgment has been overturned by the righteousness of one man. See, you only think in self, you only think in selfish viewpoints. Most people don't do. Death, death is from the perspective of Almighty God, not you. If you're down here under God's grace, you are not, you, you were baptized into Christ to live under who? God. If you serve sin under grace, guess who you're dead to? The one who put you in Christ to make you alive unto him. And so if you serve sin under grace, it's unto death. You get that choice. You get that option. What's, what's option B? <laughs> the only one that should, I mean the only true option. Obedience under righteousness. What does Paul mean by that? What is obedience unto righteousness? Well, look what he says. God be thanked that you are the servants of sin. Serving what? If they're serving sin, what's it unto? Death. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of what? Doctrine which was delivered you. When was it delivered? This is the first time Paul's even talked to these Romans. You getting it? When did Paul give him the form of doctrine? He just did in the chapter. If you obey this form of doctrine that I've just given to you, 
about who God has made you in Christ for your sanctification unto him. He says, he's saying, if you will obey this form of doctrine which was delivered to you, then you're going to be made free from sin and become servants of righteousness. You know what that means? If you obey Romans 6, 1, down to verse, verse uh, uh, 16, guess what you're going to become? Now, isn't that better than 613 laws? Now, now listen, we're not saying this is the end of the road here. This is the beginning. You have got to learn these positional facts here about who you are in Christ. Know them and believe them, and you will pass from a servant of sin to become a servant of righteousness. Now the rest of your life is still out ahead of you. When you begin this life, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are what? Sons of God. You're no longer in bondage to fear. Right? You've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. And we're going to look at that here in one second. But the proper response to this Right? Is to under, if you properly respond to what Paul says in Romans 6, 1 through 16, if, 17, if you properly respond to the form of doctrine which was delivered about your positional sanctification, your position in Christ, understanding that you're freed from sin, you're alive unto God, you don't let sin reign, you yield yourselves unto God. Most people just looking for an excuse to sin. You didn't even need an excuse back here. Well, if I, you know, if I believed like y'all and that we're under grace, I'd just do what I want to. Man did what he wanted to for 4,000 years long before God's grace was reigning in the earth. Man don't need God's grace and excuse to live after his flesh. Now God has set you free and says, do what you want. But there's consequences. You know, there, it doesn't take anything for a man to become a man that his body just naturally matures. But there's a lot involved in being a man. Amen? There's a lot of responsibility that comes with being a son of God, called into this position, separated. Do you understand that you were separated by God from sin to serve him in eternity? That there's some purposes he has for you. It ain't just about what he wants from you today or tomorrow. You have been brought into an eternal life to live unto God. This life you've been given eternally is to be lived unto him. Christ died unto sin once, but in that he liveth. How long does he live? In that he liveth, he liveth unto who? To God. For how long? Forever. Right? A proper response to this is going to free you from sin and make you a servant of righteousness. This is what Paul's writing about Romans 8 too. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Proper response, Paul says that you were made free from sin, verse 18, and become the servant of righteousness. The results of this proper response or improper response. You want to continue serving sin? Verse 21 is going to be your is going to be the results. You will be fruitless and function in death. That's functional death, fruitless death. What fruit had you in the things whereof ye are now ashamed? Did you ever bring any forth? Did you bring any fruit forth? Did you, did you bring forth any fruit living in sin? Did you bring forth any fruit unto God? Why? The end of those things is what? Death. Do you know what the end of living unto sin does? It ain't hell. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, 
to quote that verse about hell is completely ripping it out of its context. The end of those things is death. You know what living after the flesh and serving sin is going to bring you? Nothing. Nothing. It brings forth nothing unto God. You are put in Christ to live unto him. And the things that you used to do that you're now ashamed of, what fruit did you have in them? Zero. The end of those things is death. It's of no value to God. But being made free from sin, here's the, here's the, here's the result of a proper response. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto what? Holiness. That's why you're in Christ. And when we bring forth these fruits of life, they are unto holiness, meaning they are, they are things that God values. They're, they're, they're qualities in you that God finds useful to him. And the end what? What is the end of that fruit? Everlasting life. Right? Look over at Romans 7, 6. I'm getting ready to close. Romans 7, 6. How do we serve God? Paul said, we are now delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Guys, I, I know these things are tough. Romans 6, 7. But we, you, you really have to meditate on these things and, and really get caught up on these things to what it, what does it mean to be delivered from the law what is it what what is dead wherein i was held right what wh where, where i used to be held is now dead and then he says he says that we should Understanding how you're going to serve is key for you to understand what you've been delivered for from and what's now dead so that you can serve, not in the oldness of the letter, but in what? Newness of spirit. What does that mean? Newness of spirit. Notice that that spirit there is not the Holy Spirit. It's your spirit. And the way you serve is in newness of your spirit. What does that mean? Newness of spirit is serving God in a renewed mind. It's a newness of, the, the newness of spirit that Paul wants us to serve in was just given to you in Romans 6, 1 through 7, 6. You, if you, listen, knowing, believing, and obeying that form of doctrine that was just given to you in Romans 6, 1 through 7, 6 gave you the spirit to serve God. But not if you don't know it and don't believe it. Read the verses and realize that that will do more for you than 10,000 laws written in stone. Romans 6, 1 through 7, 6 gives you the very mind to serve God. Y'all understand that? And so, and so from... Last, last part, I'm really, I'm really shutting up because I ain't going to talk about this one because we ain't got time. The last thing in Romans, this section on sanctification is your functional identity. God gave you a brand new legal identity and he gave you a positional identity in his son to serve him and to live unto him. Right? Now how you function Completely how you're going to walk after this. Are you going to be one who thinks, oh no, I think I need the law. You know what Paul said about people like that? He said, Christ is of no effect and you're falling from grace. Amen. Paul said, I threw the law and dead, dead to the law that I might live unto who? God. You can't live unto God by the law. You can't live unto God by the letter. 
You live unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord and who he's made you in Christ. You got to understand who you are in Christ and know who you are in Christ before you can ever function in that identity. When Paul's talking about walking after the Spirit, he's talking about walking and functioning in the reality of that position. Amen. Functional identity. Now this does not affect Functional identity does not affect your legal or positional identity. How you function from this day forward is not going to affect your legal status or your positional status in Christ. Right? You're already dead to sin, freed from sin, alive unto God, and all those things in Christ. There's nothing you have to do to go back and change 20 years of your life. All you got to do is stop your bad thinking today. That's all you got to do. Start serving God in the newness of the spirit that you just received here this morning. We minister the spirit of God this morning. This is what the spirit of God says about you people sitting here this morning. Now walk out of here with that new mind. And serve God in that new spirit. What does it mean to walk after the flesh? What Paul's talking about in Romans 8, 1. Those who walk after the flesh and after the spirit. Walking after the flesh is walking in ignorance, unbelief, and disobedience. To Romans 6, 1 through 7, 6. That's to put yourself back under a law system. Thinking that, it's, that you're under grace to sin. Whatever it may be. If your thinking is not in line with what Paul laid out in Romans 6, 1 through 7, 6, you're walking after the flesh. Three things are going to cause it. Ignorance, unbelief, or disobedience. You may know the doctrine. You may even believe the doctrine and say, yeah, I'm dead unto sin. But decide you're going to let sin reign in your mortal body. You may not obey it. Walking after the Spirit is knowing the doctrine, believing the doctrine, and obeying the doctrine. Right? Romans 6, 7, Paul says, He that is dead is freed from sin. Do you believe that? Okay, well, you just read it, now you know it. Do you believe it? Or are you going to believe how your flesh feels? Right? A person walking around saying, oh, I'm just in, you know, we're just all in bondage to sin. You liar. I've got all authority in that Bible to call you a liar. Because the Bible said he that is dead is freed from sin. Don't tell me you're in bondage to sin. Right? Romans 6.10 or Romans 6.11. We already said it. You're told what to do there. Reckon it. How you respond to that. It's going to determine how you walk in the, in, if you're walking after the flesh or after the spirit. Romans 7, 6, if you deny that one. If you try to serve God in an old way instead of a new way, you're walking after the flesh. I want you to understand is walking after the flesh and after the spirit has already been detailed before you get to Romans 8, 1. Walking after the spirit is responding to the doctrine of the spirit of God given to you about who he's made you in Christ and learning to walk in obedience to who you are in Christ. Right? Paul said in Romans 8, 5, they that are after the flesh. If you want to know who walks after the flesh, they mind the things of the flesh. If you want to know who walks after the spirit, they mind the things of the spirit. Right? The things of the flesh, here, here's what happens to people. People that are after the flesh, the things of the flesh are of a higher reality to that carnal mind. They cannot discern spiritual realities Everything that they experience is discerned through the flesh. So here's what these people do, and I've watched them. I deal with these people on a regular basis, by the way. 
These people have problem with only one thing and one thing only, and that's any type of preaching of righteousness. They will justify sodomites, liquor heads. They will justify anything. God ain't judging sin today. God's not imputing sin today. The only person they'll criticize is anybody that preaches any type of obedience under righteousness. In other words, the only sin in their eyes is preaching obedience under righteousness so that we can live under God. What vile, wicked stuff, man. I wanted you to understand this, and I'm, I'm shutting up. These people always take the things of the Spirit of God and classify them as positional reality. They take the things of the Spirit, freed from sin, positional only. Alive unto God, positional only. A servant of righteousness, positional only. They take, they, they take the things of God's Spirit and they classify them as positional truths only. And then they take the things of their flesh as functional reality. Yeah, we're freed from sin positionally, but not functionally. We're still in bondage to sin in our flesh. We're alive unto God. You know what they're saying? They're saying that the things of the flesh are a higher truth and a higher reality than the things of the Spirit of God. And I put that in the realm of unbelief. Amen. If you learn to if you learn and understand what I'm saying, guys, when Paul brings you into Romans 8, he's already given you everything you need to walk. He's given you everything. He's given you every excuse in the world not to go back to that. Because that thing's going to bring you back under sin and death. He's brought you to the dominion of God's grace, to the righteousness of his son unto eternal life. And he shows you the very sanctification God gave you in his son to free you from sin that you might live unto him by serving righteousness. And understanding that you're not in bondage, you're not dead, let God tell you who you are. He says, you're alive unto him. He says, look here, you can live unto me. I've made you alive unto me. I've made you freed from sin to become a servant of righteousness. The choice is yours. And the choice you make is whether you're going to walk after the flesh or you're going to walk after the spirit. And if you walk after the flesh, you're going to function in sin and death. But if you walk after the spirit, you're going to begin to function in the righteousness and life that God has given you through his spirit. And that's just the beginning of it, guys. Romans 8, believe it or not, as tough as this doctrine is, it's just the beginning. Paul just gave you the foundational principle of how to begin to function in life. That life, once you begin to live it, is eternal. And it doesn't stop today or tomorrow. I'm going to wake up tomorrow, Bill, and God is going to teach me more things about, about who he is and what he's given me to do and how to guide my steps. Once you start living this life, you know what you're living? living unto God as a son and he's being unto you a father that spirit of adoption is two spirits in one did you know that it's the spirit of God the father and the spirit of God the son it's teaching me as a father teaches and it's teaching me to walk as a son I'm being brought into the unity of this relationship between God the father you were called into the fellowship of God's dear son did you know that it's 1 Corinthians 1, 9. When you begin to walk after the Spirit, you are now being led by the Spirit of adoption, crying, Abba, Father. And the Father's teaching you 
his mind and his will, and he's teaching you how to walk as his son and to live unto him. Amen. Any questions? Not too confusing? You understood it all perfectly? No. They, they struggle over there. I noticed Wayne back here. He's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's ready to go back to Anderson Night Church. He's, Go home and watch some. Uh, what's 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 your what's your favorite pastor? <laughs> pastor Pastor Shelley, is that your favorite? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, God. Uh, I pray that you take this message, Lord. How much it's helped me in my life and helped me to understand, God. Uh, you know. Lord, I, I hate to say that I still struggle and I still have problems, Lord, because that denies who I am in, in your son. But Lord, you and I know that, that there's things that I still don't know, I still don't understand, I'm still ignorant of, Father. And God, just help me to see that, that great prize that's before me of the fullness of your son, the, the great prize of knowing him and, and not having my own righteousness, but having the the very righteousness that you've freely given us by the faith of Jesus Christ. Help, help me to, to see those things, Lord, and to strive for them, understanding that these things are not uh, uh, won by the works of the flesh, but they are freely given through the ministry of your word, through, through the spirit and who you've made us in your son. Teach us all to walk after that spirit, God, and, and that, that we may function and fully develop and grow into that new creature that you've created us all to be in Christ for the, for the life that now is and for that which also is to come. And God, I just ask that you keep everybody safe, bring them back safely Wednesday night. We ask it all in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.